Let us go to the gospel according to Luke chapter 15. And I'm going to read starting at verse 11. You don't have to stand. I know you're familiar with this scripture, but let's look at it um, fresh. And let's read it again for someone who may be reading it for the first time. So today I'm going to read it out of the NIV. Luke chapter 15 verse 11. When you have it, say amen. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. King James says riotous living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say unto him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up. He went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's what? And let's celebrate. I want to go back to verse 21. The words of the son. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. As we prepare for communion, I want to speak to you uh, for a few moments from a simple subject entitled guilt. Everybody say guilt. Days like this when we come to the communion table, we commemorate the sacrifice of our Lord and we celebrate the fact that we are the recipients of the fruit of that sacrifice. Because of what he did, somebody say we are saved. Saved from our sins. Saved from the penalty of death and eternal separation from God. We are saved because of what Christ did. Our entire being. He was wounded for our transgressions our outward sins bruised for our iniquities and when there's a bruise that means there's something going on under the surface that's for our inward sins the chastisement of our peace was upon him that's deliverance in our spirit man and with his stripes we are healed and that means there's salvation even in our physical bodies but question can you possess something and not know it Mm. The National Association of Unclaimed Property Associations have estimated that one out of seven Americans have unclaimed money. One out of seven Americans have unclaimed money. So look up and down your road and count to seven. <laughs> tell somebody on your road, tell them, go get your money, go get your money. One out of seven. People in America have unclaimed money and the, un and the estimated value of unclaimed money in the state treasuries collectively is an estimated $80 billion. So without knowing it, a rich man can die of poverty. When we get saved, we don't get a certificate, not from heaven anyway, but by faith we receive it and we start drawing from that salvation. Mm. And just like you can be rich and not know it, 
you can be free and not know it. When we celebrate Juneteenth in our country, we're celebrating that once the Emancipation Proclamation, that 13th Amendment took place in 1863, all enslaved people were free. But two and a half years later, when soldiers got to Texas, they found people who were still working on plantations. Why were they still working on plantations? Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, they didn't know. But now we know. We are saved and we know. We've been rescued, we've been ransomed, no more slaves to sin. But for some of us, our joy is not complete. It's not. The height of our excitement is not where it should be. It's not being saved. Because many believers are suffering silently from guilt. I'm not screaming, but I want y'all to hear what I'm saying. What is guilt? It's the feeling or emotion connected to the fact of, of you knowing that you have committed a specified or implied offense or a crime against something or someone. Somebody shout guilty. See, shame is different from guilt. Because you can suffer shame from something that's not your fault. But guilt is connected to something you know you did. In our salvation discourse, we testify about how Jesus dropped the charges. Dropped them against us. Why? Because he took our place. We call it in theology, substitutionary atonement. According to scriptures, what does that mean? Sin must be paid for. And when Jesus Christ died, he suffered as a substitute in our place on behalf of fallen humanity. Christ's death made it possible for men and women to be declared, hold on, to be declared righteous. Based on our faith in him, Christ's death was not merely a statement against evil or an expression of love, but it was a payment that satisfied God's demand. Christ's death was necessary. He took the fall. He took the rap. We're now declared not guilty. But listen, being found not guilty doesn't always eradicate the feeling of guilt. Guilt is a residue. It's what's left over. You moved on, but you're still carrying the residue. It's like being in the car with a smoker, and I'm not attacking anybody. But you know it. If, you, if you've been in a car with a smoker, it's come, it comes through the vents. I mean, you can spray a little something, you know. To the point, you can no longer be in the car. Not there anymore, but still carrying the fragrance of it. Mm. The Lord told me to preach this. So I'm just speaking it to somebody in the room. Guilt doesn't mean you're not forgiven. Hear me. It doesn't mean you're not forgiven. It means you haven't forgiven yourself. Many of us carry guilt because we don't feel we were the best parents to our children. But I want to tell you that you don't have to be a perfect parent to be a good parent. Let's clap with her. Come on, let's clap with her. Sometimes when we embrace a moment in a, in a, in a preaching moment, uh, it helps fortify it in our hearts and our spirits. So every once in a while, just say amen. Maybe you didn't make all the right decisions with your kids. Maybe you didn't say everything right. And maybe you weren't emotionally available, but you're here now. Someone is dealing with guilt because of something that happened in your marriage. You guys got past it, but you really never got over it. Guilt. Somebody may be suffering from survivor's guilt. You should be celebrating the fact that you made it out. But every time you will celebrate that you made it out, you're reminded that somebody connected to you didn't. Many of us don't feel worthy to sing this gospel. We don't feel worthy to preach this gospel. This guilt has affected us from being an effective witness because 
when we would stand for the kingdom, guilt taps us on our shoulder and remind us of how unworthy we really are. Because listen to me, guilt is never about the future. It's always about the past. You can never feel guilty about something that ain't happened yet. Guilt keeps you locked up in the prison of regrets. I want you to lay hands on somebody's shoulder and tell them no more regrets, no more. You can't live there. You can't, you can't live there. That's prison. That's prison. Now I want you to look at somebody and tell them come out of that prison. See, the prison doors are open, but you're still on the inside. Mm. It causes you not to believe or hope. It keeps you from having aspirations and expectations. It makes you settle beneath your goals because the voice of guilt says, don't hope for better because you don't deserve it. Guilt says, I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve to be loved or have someone to love. I don't deserve the right to celebrate my accomplishments. But I want to ask you a question. Why are you still making payments on a debt that has been canceled? Mm, why? Why? If you don't get delivered from guilt, people will use the portal of your guilt to keep you trapped and controlled. And I'm not even talking about, you could be an ex, but I'm not talking about an ex. I'm not even just talking about your spouse. Your children can use your guilt. I say your, ch your own children can use your guilt to keep you controlled. The enemy will use your guilt and cause you to stay away. Stay away from God. Stay away from church. There are some people who are still away from home. And still away from their families. Not because they're still mad. But because they're still feeling guilty. Guilt will keep you outside by the shed. When you didn't even realize that the party is for you. You know this parable. You know it. It's been labeled in, 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 in academia among Bible commentaries as the parable of the prodigal son. It's coupled with the parable of the lost coin. One thing about the lost coin is speaking to us. The lost coin and the lost son. The lost coin was lost in the house. And the son was lost outside of the house. Tell your neighbor, still lost. <laughs> You can be in the house and still lost. A young son comes to his father and says, give me my inheritance. I want my inheritance. Now, the inheritance is his. That's why he says my inheritance. But it's something that he's supposed to receive after his father's death. So to desire or to ask and request for the inheritance before the father dies can communicate to the father's heart that I wish you were dead. And the father gives it to him. <sighs> mm. See, there's a difference in being sent and being released. There's sometimes with your own children, you just have to release them. Mm. And one of the hardest things to do is love somebody that you can't rescue. It, I mean, you genuinely love them, but you realize you can't save them. So releasing them is not that I don't, I don't care about them anymore. Releasing them is that I have come to the acknowledgement of my limitation. Ooh, glory be to God. I have come to the borders of my ability. And man's limitations is God's opportunity. But God will never work 
if some of you saviors don't get out of the way. Mm. The Bible says the father gave his son what he asked for. And he left. He left. And he went at a distance. He didn't stay close by. Evidently, he was battling, battling with identity. Because sometimes you can want to try to discover yourself outside of the sphere or the circle or the family or the culture or the people you've been a part. And it'll make you, uh, it'll make you run away from your true identity to put on a cloak of something that don't belong to you. I know this. I know this not because of what I read in the Bible. I know this because in my own life, I know what it is to start feeling claustrophobic. And you start, you start, I feel like I'm losing myself. And we forgot you're supposed to. Because the Bible says you'll never find yourself until you lose yourself. Mm. But we want, we don't, we're afraid to lose ourselves in God, but willing to lose ourselves in other people and other things. The Bible said he went out partying. Every night he was he was spending that money. But what he didn't realize that you can't spend and not make. Some of us are still learning that. Some of us are spending more than what we're what we're making. And as long as he had money, he had friends. But then the Bible says he spent everything. He spent he spent everything. And God let him. He spent everything and the father never left the porch. <laughs> never went looking for him. Have you ever thought about that? That the father never went looking for the son. He spent everything. He lost everything to the point he, he had to do something he had never done before. He hired himself out. I'm not saying he never worked before. He'd worked before. Because a good father raises sons who work. So I'm not saying he had never worked before. But this was different. Because when he was working for his father, he was really working for himself. <laughs> but now he had to hire himself out to somebody else. And you're going to find out that people who don't love you, they handle you differently. I'm telling you. Some of them, let me tell you. As much as some of you will work overtime and volunteer during church time so so, so you can make a couple of extra dollars. And I'm not against working and making things happen. But all of you who will feel like, oh, my job, my job, my job, my job. You die. Your job will replace you very quickly. Some of you got to always make that extra dollar. You can never take time for your family. You can never take time for your children because my job, my job, my job. You roll over and die. And they will find somebody to sit in your place. Don't, I don't work. Come on. I don't live just to work. I work so I can live. And he realized. He, he's working for somebody else now. And it's all about the numbers. It, it's all about production. He's working for somebody else. But the issue is, he just got the job that pays later, but he's hungry now. <laughs> it pays, but you got to work first. You know, we call it in, we call it in our day, uh, a week in a, you know, a week in a hole. You don't, you don't go to work on Monday. Uh, and some people don't have that revelation because they'll start borrowing money from people now. Yeah, because I'm going to start, I, I start in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to start in two weeks and get paid on the day you start. And the Bible says that he went and found a job working for a pig herder. Feeding pigs. Now for us, that may not seem uh, as a real big thing. But for a Jew, that is. Because pigs are considered unclean. And so now he's working with things that are unclean. Because <sighs> he's far away from his assignment. He's far away from his identity. Now he's doing things that he thought he would never do. 
being in places he thought he would never go. Mm. And while he's feeding the pigs, he looks down. He looks down and his mind begins to slip. Because when you get hungry, hunger makes you compromise. Hunger makes you compromise. Hunger starts to shift your perception. You got to be careful. You got to be careful. You got to be very careful. Because when you get hungry, you start getting desperate. And at time you get desperate, you start making bad decisions. Decisions that make you look over in the bed the next morning and asking your, yourself, what in the world was I thinking about? Y'all not sitting in a minute here. When you get hungry, you got to be careful about going grocery shopping while you're hungry. You make a list and establish, this is what I need and this is what I'm going for. And this is the only thing I'm purchasing. Because if you leave that thing open, oh, I'm preaching to somebody in one of these sections. I'm preaching to somebody. If you leave that, tell your neighbor, don't leave it open. You got to establish. Establish your, establish your standards before you start starving because if your standards are not established you will either buy something you don't need or buy something you already have and when you get hungry you'll pay for more than what it's worth mm. and the Bible says he looked at pig slop and almost ate it almost he, he, he almost now I, I want see the devil will hold over your head every time you messed up and, and, and he'll keep on listing things you did wrong but I need about 10 people to thank God that he pulled you back from the almost come on oh come on oh, oh yes I went some places uh, 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 don't y'all don't y'all do that like that don't y'all pat a cake I went some places I went some places I did some things oh I I talked to this section over here because y'all acting booja. I've been some places and I did some things, but I'm so glad that even in my sin, God had a standard in me. I know y'all don't understand that. I know y'all don't understand because I, I may have done some drugs, but there were some drugs when I almost touched it. God and the Bible said, the moment he almost filled his belly with pig slop he came to him he came to himself and this is my prayer in here that somebody will come back to themselves because you don't even know to come back to God until you come back to yourself hey I need you to push your neighbor, tell your neighbor, come back, come back, come back. You, at some point, you got to start looking at the pattern of your life and look at some of your last decisions and say, this is not me. See, some people will start telling you, accept it, that's who you are, the devil is a liar. This is not me. I want you to scream at somebody and tell them, I did what they said I did, but that's not who I am. I'm a son. Come on. Come on. Tell somebody. I'm a daughter. That's who I am. Somebody scream. I'm going back to God. Listen what he says. Listen what he says. I'm going back. Because even my father's servants got it better than this. Even my father's servants got it better than this. And so when he, he went back, and the Bible says, and the father saw him coming. Still didn't run, still didn't run it quick all the way. He saw him coming afar off, start making preparations. But even when he started coming, the father started making his way to him. We used to say it in church, if you make one step, he'll make two. And I believe that. But the truth is, before you made that step, the father had already made a way for you to come back. The father made a way. Come on. Because he could have shut the door on me. He could hey, shut up. He made, oh God. He could have. Mm. Woo! 
the Bible said, the Bible said, when he, when he got to the house, the father embraced him and said to everybody, quick, 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 get the robe, get some shoes. It almost seemed like he didn't say switch out his shoes. It was like, get some shoes. Because he may have lost his shoes. And sometimes we got to look up and say, how much have I lost? How much have I really lost? And see, some of us don't want to do that because that's scary. Because if we really count it up, we're scared that we may slip into a really deep place of depression. I don't want you to count it up to feel bad about yourself. I want you to count it up to see what you need to recover. The Bible said he, he stood and, and the father started making preparation. All right, get the robe, yeah, get the shoes, y'all get the supper ready, get the food ready. And while the father is ready to celebrate him, listen to what he's saying. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be your son. I'll just be your servant. He's ignoring the fact that the father is excited about him being home. The father is preparing a feast for him. And he's still saying, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. What would make him keep saying that? Guilt. Guilt. And so maybe we have accepted the fact that God can heal people of cancer. But we struggle whether he can forgive us of our sins. Wow. Wow. No, really? No, we do. Because when the, we always preach about how the man's friends tore the roof off and let their friend that was paralyzed down. And when, when they let him down, Jesus said something crazy. He didn't, he didn't say, I heal you now in my name. No, that's not what he said. He said, your sins are forgiven. And the people say, whoa, what? Whoa, what? What? Because the Lord was proven. He says, some of you think it's easier for me to heal than it is for me to forgive. And I know if I say, how many of y'all thank God for forgiveness and forgiveness is yours? Yeah, you're about to clap and we'll shout. But the way you operate afterward tells me you're still feeling guilty. You don't, you don't, it, I can tell the way you move, the decisions you make, how you hold your head. You cloak it and call it humility when the truth is it's guilty. Mm. And so um, that's all. The Lord just wanted me to tell you that when he died for you, yes, wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With the stripes, hey, we are healed. But he's also delivering you from guilt and shame. As far as the east is from the west. I throw your sins that direction and remember it no more. I'll choose to forget. Omniscient God. Lift up your hands. May you live like it never happened. May you forever be grateful. But may you come from under the cloak of guilt and shame. And accept the robe that the Father has for you. Accept the robe that the Father has for you. Now, always to be somebody who will try to bring it up, I'll throw it in your face. But I don't want you to look at your neighbor. I don't want you to touch your neighbor. I want you to touch your own heart and say, I'm forgiven. And shout, and I forgive myself. Mm. Oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Well, you keep saying I'm not worthy when he made you worthy. 
Hey, this is Bishop S.Y. Younger. Thank you for watching this video. And now what I need you to do is like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can continue to get more inspirational, motivational, and gospel content in your direction.